Hi, I'm Rebecca Blake. I'm the Advocacy Liaison for the Graphic Artists Guild, and you're listening to Guildcast. Guildcast is a weekly podcast series based on the three pillars of the Graphic Artists Guild, advocacy, community, and business resources. Keep listening to learn more about the Graphic Artists Guild and visit our website at www.graphicartistsguild.org. Or they ask the question, do I have to do social media, like at all? Right. (laughs) Um, Or they just don't want to mess with it in the slightest. And my advice has always been to people, um, quality over quantity. If you are not comfortable um, managing three social media accounts, don't. Just do one. Pick one. Be really good at it. Guildcast is brought to you in part by Graphic Arts Today. This week's Guild resource is a continuation from last week's Ask a Pro Mistakes I've Made with Chrissy Meschieri and Liz DeFiore. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Erin Harris. I am the New England Regional Admin for the Guild, uh, which is why we're saying hi to some of the New England people. (laughs) Um, So welcome to our webinar. This is Ask a Pro's Mistakes I've Made, part two. Uh, We did part one a couple months ago, and we had a whole lot more to talk about. So we decided to do, excuse me, to do a second one. Um, So some of the stuff we covered uh, back then, I'm going out of order, aren't I? Yes, I am. Um, So during during the first one, we covered, um, you know, creating your own business name, uh, business basics about setting up a bank account, using contracts, uh, getting to your first clients, um, how to make sure you get paid, fun stuff like that. Uh, So if you are interested in all that, you should go and watch the previous version, uh, or rather the first edition of this, uh, because we're not going to cover any of that today. (laughs) So, uh, all right. So uh, I'm curious. If, if you guys are guild members, tell us in the chat because we'd like to know how many of you are here. <laughs> uh, all right. So today we are going to talk to uh, Chrissy Macheri, who is an illustrator and one of our uh, associate reps, and Liz DeFiore, who is, uh, sorry, Chrissy is a designer and an illustrator. Liz is an illustrator uh, who is also our New England <laughs> our New England regional rep. Um, so Chrissy, you want to go first and tell us a little bit about you, even though I've made you jump through all the slides? Yeah, sure. I am happy to click through. This is perfect. <laughs> uh, so I'm a freelance graphic designer and illustrator. I specialize in branding, advertising, and illustration. I've been freelancing for over six years, almost seven. Um, and I am the Southern Associate Rep for the Guild. Um, you can see that's my website and my Instagram. Um, and these are just some examples of my work so you guys can see what I do. Over to Liz. Hi, I'm Liz, and I'm a freelance children's book illustrator. Uh, I've also done uh, illustration work for an indie video game, uh, plenty of private commissions, and I also uh, stream twice a week on Twitch uh, the creation of my artwork. I've been a full-time freelancer since uh, October of 2018. I just got uh, published for the first time this year, and I just got my second book contract uh, a, a couple of days ago. Uh, so I, even though I've been freelancing for a, um, almost three years now, I'm still still learning learning all of the ropes and and uh, getting a regular client base. So I uh, I have plenty of plenty of things to share. <laughs> all right, so perfect. All right. So do we want to jump right into it? Yeah, let's let's start. So last time we left off, uh, right before we got into all of the fun marketing uh, marketing stuff. So this, uh, there are a lot of. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can do in terms of marketing, but the main rule is that you have to. <laughs> like, you can't you can't just sit back and wait for clients to come to you. Um, so there are a couple things that you really need to keep in mind. Um, the first is to own your own digital land, which means you need to have a website. Um, Facebook page is not an acceptable substitute for a website. Sorry, <laughs> but it's not. Um, yeah. So like I, I have my portfolio up 
on my own website that I run through WordPress that I have self-hosted. Um, Liz, how is your setup again? So I, I have mine uh, set up through WordPress. I own the URL, uh, uh, right. so I, I pay to have the, the hosting. And so it's a custom URL and everything. And um, thankfully, my husband is a, a programmer, so we were able to tweak a, a basic template in order to better fit my needs. But there are so many really good templates, especially for and free, um, like, portfolio templates and such through WordPress uh, that if you're if you're looking for something that's gonna look nice and professional and be customizable, um, that is a pretty good starter option. Yeah, and Chrissy, yours is set up, uh, you're not using WordPress, right? You're using something else. Yeah, I use Squarespace. I used to have my own website hand-coded, and like I explained to someone, it's duct tape in the background, and I realized I'm not a web designer, and I don't want to do web design. So after five years of not updating my website ever, I realized that that just wasn't working for me. And so I purchased a Squarespace account and then just transferred my domain over there. And I have it set up where Zuckrizzy, which is my handle everywhere, is a short URL that you can use to forward onto my master website, uh, which is chrissymuscadia.com, which is unpronounceable and untypable. So just make it easy to type in. <laughs> like Lizzie by design is perfect because you can just type it out and get there really easily without having to write it out for people. So yeah, that was a mistake I made. <laughs> one of the mistakes I made was uh, there's another designer with my name who has the .com. And so I just put in my middle initial, which is very tedious to remind people of. And I've definitely previously like missed emails from people and stuff because they've forgotten my middle initial. So check things like that when, when you're picking your URL. Um, you know, look to see if anybody's got similar names to see if they, um, to see if they have, if you're planning to use a business name, make sure you're not using just like the .NET version of whatever theirs is because it will get confusing. Yeah, you, you want to make it something you think people are going to remember. Um, and making it your name can work. You just need to make your name enough a part of your brand that it's like everywhere. They're not going to be like, oh, that one designer, what was their name? Yeah. <laughs> just... And having it be consistent across everything is really helpful too. So jumping over to our second point of social media, um, that's why I bought the Zucrizy handle for it. Um, Cause that ties into all of my online profiles and turns. Yeah. And fans. I have Lizzie by design for all of my handles as well. Yeah. It just makes it really easy. One for thing for people to look up. Cause if you struggle to remember things, you can only imagine someone who doesn't know your name, they're going to struggle as mm -hmm. well. So yeah. Like with mine, I just have my middle initial in there and it's helpful sometimes, but like I said, I need, I need to do a new URL cause it's just, it's too hard to remind people. <laughs> um, yeah, so even if you don't have your own website, if you use something like Behance or if you're a guild member, you can put work up on uh, your member portfolio page. Uh, it is helpful to have a URL, um, whatever you choose it to be, and you can always redirect it to your guild page or Behance or another site like that if you don't want to go through the process of setting up your own site yet, if you're still new enough that that's not really... Um, in your plans yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but having the URL makes it a lot easier than having to say graphic, graphic artist guild.org slash however many things are after that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so then like we just touched on uh, social media is another important thing. Um, but I think one of the mistakes people make first is that they try to be everywhere and they either end up really fatigued from trying to be everywhere or they find um, they find they just don't want to be everywhere. So what about you guys? What's your experience been, um, been with um, that? I so I used to be a social media manager for, uh, like that was my day job, <laughs> was managing social media accounts for companies. And um, I always found that like either people... Uh, I, as you said, tried to be everywhere or they ask the question, do I have to do social media like at all? Right. <laughs> um, but they just don't want to mess with it in the slightest. And my advice has always been to people, um, quality over quantity. If you are not comfortable, um, managing three social media accounts, don't. Just do one. Pick one. Be really good at it. Um, 
because the only way to be successful with social media is to be consistent and to be putting out quality content on a regular basis. And it's just, it's a lot of work and it's better to, it's better to have like one that you're going to focus on rather than to have a bunch of social accounts that look dead because Mm -hmm. you're just not able to, to get to them. So I have, I have a bunch but I also manage them all. So I, I mean, I used to do this as, as my day job. Um, so I've got Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and then Twitch, I would count as a, as a social, um, as a social site because I have to put content on there regularly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I just use Instagram primarily. And then I have like Dribble and Behance, which kind of count. They're more like online portfolios versus social media, um, but they do sort of count because it's online and you get to interact with people. Um, but what I do is I have a Facebook and a, or a Twitter. I never use it. And so I literally just write, this account is inactive. Please visit me on Instagram. Um, and the main reason for that is I don't want anyone to somehow pick Zakrizi and then snag those things up for me and then create confusion in the market in terms of that's not me and then having to educate people. So I just snagged all the social, or the, yeah, social media accounts that have my handle and just parked them so that way people are aware of where they should follow me. I, I don't do well with Twitter. I'm not a words person. I'm a pictures person. <laughs> I think it's also important to know it, and I and we may cover this a little bit later. But on the topic of marketing, you want to know where your client base is, like who you want to be connecting with. Um, I'm I'm a children's illustrator, so the people I want to connect with are authors who want to self-publish and art directors of publishing companies. Um, and authors who want to self-publish are, uh, in I have found mostly on Facebook where they're they're like looking for advice. So I, I join a bunch of Facebook groups within that topic and have a presence there. Um, so that's separate from my Facebook page where I'm also putting in effort. Um, and then art directors and art directors are on um, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, for for my industry. So like the kind of content that I'm putting out on the, in these places is different and tailored to the kind of people that I'm trying to attract. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's, that's a good summary. <laughs> All right. Um, so you, Liz already touched on the next part, which was to be consistent across all of all of the places you are, like try to use the same profile photo, or if you're using um, one of your illustrations or designs, like try to keep that as consistent as you can. So that way people know that they have found the right person. Mm -hmm. Um, And then other than that, um, really just keep in mind that anything you put online is there forever. Mm -hmm. Um, You never know if someone's going to have taken a screenshot or saved it or, or what. So just, be aware of what you're what you're posting and yeah pretty much just be smart about what you're what you're putting Yeah. And it ties back into the be consistent part. Um, Like Liz was saying, she's very consistent as to the type of work she's posting on each account. Not only that, you want to make sure that the type of work you're putting up is consistent as well. It can be really tempting to just be like, oh my gosh, I haven't posted in two days. I've got to put something up. Otherwise my followers are going to unfollow me. They don't actually realize how long it's been since you posted. So you don't have to be like, guys, I'm so sorry. I've been so busy. They didn't realize you hadn't posted anything. And so you're actually letting them know it's been a while and posting things for the sake of posting things may not be in your benefit if it's something that's not so good. Um, Because if that's the first thing that they see of your work, they're going to judge you off of that. They're not going to go through and see that, you know, this was a rough day for you. You hadn't drawn in a couple days. You're a little rusty. Um, So be very consistent as to the type of work you're posting and ask yourself, is this showing the best side of the work I do? Now, of course, don't be so retentive about that, that you never post ever. Um, But just make sure that what you're posting aligns with the type of work that you're doing. Or it makes sense that all of a sudden you switch from vector work over to watercolors. Um, But there's a reason for doing that yeah like if you if you need to post progress shots like do it within like you know explaining the context around it and stuff and that can be a great way to have content while you're in the middle of projects Mm -hmm. um but yeah i would i would agree with everything chrissy said (laughs) yeah you're right and for depending on what your specialty is progress shots sometimes people actually really want to see Mm -hmm. um i know that's true with uh, with some UX designers, I know they put up case studies and they put up their sketches in addition to their finalized um, 
their finalized pieces because it shows the thought process as to how they got there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Liz had some really good advice uh, when we were talking the other day, which was to find the person you who has the job you want and then look at how they're doing things. You want to expand on that, Liz? Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. It was yeah, very good if advice. You're, if you're not sure... Like if you're looking at putting together your website or updating your website if it if it needs it, um, and you're not sure what to do or like what you should be putting up there, what kind of work you should be including in your portfolio, um, somebody gave me this advice uh, when I was first starting out, and they said find somebody who has the job that you want and look at how they have set things up, what kind of work they're putting in their portfolio, what sorts of places that they are promoting themselves. And you can like model your foundational steps after that. So I, I found some illustrators that um, were not agent represented because I'm not agent represented right now um, and who had been published and, uh, and, and who might have uh, multiple sources of income um, and I looked at what sort of websites they put together and what sort of work they were putting up. Maybe they have work similar to mine in, in, in terms of content, um, in terms of theme and such. So like what sort of publishers are they submitting to um, or, or their work has been published through? Maybe I should be submitting to those publishers too uh, because if they like that person's work, maybe they'll like my work. It gives you a really good... Um, it gives you a really good roadmap if you're feeling like you're floundering and not sure which direction to go in. Right. And the other the other part of that advice you gave us was to remember to keep marketing yourself even when you're not, even when you have work. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't just stop when you get a contract because by the time when it's over, you have to start all over again. And yeah, I think that was Chrissy's actually. <laughs> oh, was it? Me. I don't know if she's above I me. I think it was Chrissy. She's saying. above me on the screen too. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was, that was also really good advice. Cause like you were saying, you'd have to start from scratch every time you stop, um, every time you finish a contract, you then have to go back. Whereas if you keep in touch with people while you're working, if you keep posting work, and doing that, you're you're still building up connections while you're working on the paid work you have. So you're not yeah. having to redo everything each time. And it helps you avoid what happened to me, which was I had a five year gap in my portfolio that I had done work that entire time, but I'd never posted any of it. And so people were judging me based off of work that I'd done five years ago versus, you know, my style had changed completely in those five years. Um, so even if you have to schedule, you know, once a month, I'm going to post a new project on my portfolio or once a week, I'm going to post onto my Instagram account or something like that. Um, just keeping it in the back of your head and keeping yourself on your toes will we'll help you out in the long run. <laughs> yeah. Remembering to schedule things can really, can really help. Guildcast is a weekly podcast series based on the three pillars of the Graphic Artists Guild, advocacy, community, and business resources. Keep listening to learn more about the Graphic Artists Guild and visit our website at www.graphicartistsguild.org. Um, something else that someone told me was to look at my Instagram. No, I keep saying Instagram because that's where I live. But look at your profiles that are public and know that even though maybe, you know, recruiters or people hiring technically shouldn't be looking at your personal social media accounts, they probably are going to do it regardless of whether or not they're allowed to. Um, so be very consistent as to how you look online. Uh, what types of pictures are you posting? Uh, either yourself or your work. Um, and how does that align with your goals for yourself professionally? And does that mean that maybe you have to split your two accounts? And so you have a personal account that's private that you post your, your pictures of you and your dog or whatnot, or you and your significant other doing who knows what. And then you have a professional account that's public and that you use almost as a self-promoter. Yeah, I know a lot of people, especially um, people who are freelancers who, who do that. Because like you said, it's, it's very easy to kind of veer too much into the personal um, if, you're, if you're not really on top of it. So the, the best thing you can do is, keep, like you said, keep yourself consistent and do mm -hmm. that. Uh, so we have a question from Sharon who wants to know, how important is LinkedIn to your networking and marketing? So are you guys using LinkedIn in particular or... Chrissy, or, do you want to take this one first? Yeah. So LinkedIn is almost, I see it as like my 
professional Facebook. So it's almost every person I've ever worked with professionally versus Facebook is like every person you've ever met somehow finds you on Facebook. <laughs> um, and so LinkedIn is really nice to reach out to old contacts. Like if they get a new job somewhere, you can say, hey, you know, Susie, I'm so excited to hear, you know, head of marketing over at, you know, Apple. That's really cool. And then as a freelancer, it's keeping you top of mind for them, but also in the unselfish part, you're celebrating people that you've worked with in the past and letting them know that you're still thinking about them. Um, so it's a way to kind of stay in touch with that professional network. And it really does count as your online resume for a lot of times. Um, and the recommendations is really nice as well. Because if you have past creative directors that you've worked with or someone that you've collaborated with and you can just reach out to them and say, hey, would you mind writing a recommendation for me? I'd really appreciate that. I really admire the work that you've done and everything I learned from you while we work together. Um, and then it kind of establishes you as a professional within the industry as well. And recruiters use LinkedIn a lot. Um, and I've gotten some job requests through LinkedIn from recruiters, uh, either looking for full-time positions or freelancers as well. Um, so if anything, it's a nice place to kind of keep up to date. Make sure you have a good picture of yourself and not, you know, one that's maybe not appropriate <laughs> for a professional right. setting. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> sure yeah. you could have, but... <laughs> Yeah, I use mine the same way where I mostly have it set up as sort of my online resume. And then I use that as a way to make, to keep links with people I've met, even if they're from conferences or things like that, where I know I'm not going to be in touch with them a huge amount. Uh, it, it sort of works a little bit like, I guess, like a phone book <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, but it's, it's a really easy way to keep in touch with every, everyone. And if people, uh, if, if other people are keeping theirs updated, you can easily make sure you have um, their most up-to-date contact information, which can be problematic, especially now because people change emails and, and phone numbers so frequently. Mm -hmm. So let's see, we've got another one. Oh, this is a good one. Um, we talk about this a lot. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we Kay <laughs> asks, how concerned are you about your graphics being taken and used by Instagram and other platforms? Mind if I take this one? Yeah, please do. <laughs> I'm going to get bitter. Hi. <laughs> I am on the advocacy committee for the Graphic Artists Guild. <laughs> um, so real quick, if you don't know, um, one of the huge things that the Graphic Artists Guild does for its members and everyone in the industry is it um, advocates on behalf of small artist copyright mm -hmm. uh, in a number of different areas. And actually, Rebecca Blake in chat <laughs> is our advocacy liaison. So if you have deeper questions about copyright, please reach out to the Guild because we are we are constantly working on this. Um, on a on like a, a personal business, no a personal business. <laughs> Personal uh, business when you freelance. <laughs> it is a ongoing issue um, that is constantly changing, uh, especially so like to, to take like the, the parts of your question specifically, like Instagram. Um, Instagram was um, recently in hot water for um, the way that a company had chosen to use images off of somebody's Instagram profile and the way that their terms and conditions were written, um, and the guilds. Uh, has been involved in in helping to figure out uh, solutions regarding that. The Guild and many other uh, associations, um, you, it's kind of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, you have to be where your um, ideal clients are. So in my, as I said before, in my case, um, art directors are constantly looking on Instagram for new illustrators to hire for publishing contracts. And so if I'm not, if I don't have a presence on Instagram, I'm severely undercutting my ability to be marketable and to be discovered. Uh, and especially especially during these th this era um, uh, when, when we've got the world in such a flux, uh, in-person events are just not possible for me to be showing off my portfolio at. Uh, so social media becomes more important than ever for me to be able to be marketable. And so you kind of like have to put things up there. Uh, my recommendation is be as educated as you possibly can be about what your rights are, what your options are. Um, if somebody does take something, um, register your copyrights with the U.S. Copyright Office. Uh, so, you know, just so that you can like fiscally protect your work, um, God forbid it, it gets stolen. Uh, and um, just be vigilant 
Um, yeah. Unfortunately, that's kind of like the best thing I can I can offer you in terms of advice at the moment. Um, but like you can use watermarks uh, depending on how your industry kind of perceives them. They can either be more obvious or less obvious. But um, it's it's ultimately a double edged sword. And I just say like be try to be educated about the issues and what's going on currently in the world of copyright and get involved in advocacy if you can, um, because that's the only way that it's going to become safer for us to be able to do our business online. Yeah. And I've had issues of people stealing my work. I was actually just talking to eBay today to try to get one of my designs taken off their website because it happens. Um, but to that, what I found that I do is I tuck my screen name really close to my art so that way, I mean, someone can go in and if they really wanted to Photoshop it out, but it's easier than just cropping the image in. And so if you tuck it in close to where the art is within the graphic, it makes it harder for other people to steal your work and not credit you. It will likely happen. Just know it's probably going to happen. And that's why, you know, helping with advocacy and stuff like that, you're helping fight the good fight and try to make that not be a problem down the road. Um, but do what you can to protect it. And like Aaron wrote, you know, make sure you read the terms and conditions of the locations you're posting to and that you're okay with those terms and conditions and not assuming that, oh, it's not going to apply to me sort of thing. So, um, nice. <laughs> that also was a very good answer. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, like you said, by virtue of putting your stuff online, it's, it's always going to be possible that someone will potentially rip off your work. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, the best thing we can do is just be vigilant about it. Know where you've ha know where you've had it posted. Um, I think you guys also mentioned that you've sometimes done reverse image searches in Google. Yeah, um, looking for that. And uh, one quick thing, and then we'll move on to the next section. Is that also for illustrators? There is a new pilot program. Oh, I forgot about that. that. Right, that Google is working on that allows you to mark your images as. Licensable? Is that a word? Available for license. Thank yeah. you. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm currently like testing out this new thing. Um, it's, it involves a little bit of like metadata stuff, which is not my forte. So it's taking me a bit. Um, but you can like if your image shows up in a Google image search, um, if you do this new thing, uh, then a little flag will be on on your image that says licensable, and that um, like is a call to action to people to uh, pay to have a license for your image rather than just stealing it, okay. <laughs> um, because. Because it, and this may come to no surprise to anybody, but a large amount of copyright infringement that happens is actually done by people who have no idea that that's what they're doing mm -hmm. because they just don't realize that what they're doing is, is stealing. Mm -hmm. um, so like the more that we can help educate uh, people who are not creators and, and people who are creators, uh, <laughs> yeah. kind of like the better world we're making for ourselves so that an easier job we'll have down the line. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Rebecca says it's not a pilot anymore. It's fully launched. And Ooh. our webinar in December is going to cover some of this on December 16th. So if you're on our mailing list, you'll get more information about that. And if you're not on our mailing list, you should sign up for it because then you'll yes. find out. <laughs> all right, let's move on to the next part because we could talk about this all day. Yeah, I know. we could talk about all of this all day, which is why we, we have, have whole webinars on part two. Right? There's a reason we have a part two of this, of this particular webinar. Um, Become a member and join the advocacy committee. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, you got it. We got enough plugs in there for the advocacy. I, <laughs> yeah, I can't even say it anymore. <laughs> All right, so the next part is uh, the part most people don't want to talk about because mm -hmm. they don't think it's fun. Um, some of us, like me, are very nerdy and really enjoy the paperwork stuff because uh, I like to file stuff and I like to color code things and I like knowing that I can find them. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so this this stuff is also really important. It's not necessarily the fun part. Uh, unless you're nerdy like I am. <laughs> uh, but you will be much, much happier later if you start keeping track of things now. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if it's only one client, uh, like make sure you keep copies of your receipts and your contract and you know any expenses you have, all of that stuff and keep it somewhere you can find it. Mm -hmm. uh, scan it and keep it digitally too because uh, you can do that now. So you can do it very easily now is what I meant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that stuff will make your life much easier later on when you need to invoice clients or anything like that. Um, is there anything particular that either of you guys do with, with how you keep records? Anything 
Yeah, so I'm really particular as to how I name my files and how I set up my folder structure. Um, and when I first get a new project, I go in and I create the folder properly for it. Um, and that just makes life so much easier. And so I, I divide it out by the client and then the project. So I've got a project folder, I've got proposals and contracts folder, and then like client branding folder. So if they have logo or style guide or anything like that, it goes in the main area. And then when you get into the projects, they're also subdivided by, you know, decks. And then you've got client files, you've got images, you've got um, copy, feedback. And if you have them all really well organized and then the file itself, I name it by the client, the project, the round of revision that it is, because, you know, they go up to 20. Um, but that way you can look up the files really easily at any point because you can say, okay, potato version two, and you'll find that within your files without having to dig through 14 versions of something called butterfly. Um, when you know it was the potato butterfly exhibit project two, and then you have the file name and all that. Or, or you have eight versions of it named final, final, yes. final, yeah. final, final, final. No, really, Never this is name the final. I'm, I'm no, sinking never. in my chair right now. <laughs> I do not possess the superpowers of Chrissy and Aaron. Well, and you're still a functioning, um, like you're still a professional, exactly. successful professional. So, you know, you don't have to be so anal. I'll tell that about myself if it doesn't work for you. You know, if what you're doing works for you, you've got your own form of organization. Perfect. You know, you don't have to adopt what we're doing. Um, no. Which admittedly, oh, what what they're doing is is something you should aspire to because that <laughs> sort of thing. The reason I say this is that sort of thing scales. So like. Um, when you've only got a small handful of clients, maybe maybe as few as like two, um, it's easy to have kind of a messy file system and get away with it and say like, no, no, this works for me. Like anywhere between two to six, I feel like clients, you can kind of get away with it. And then any, any number of clients after that, and it becomes a hot mess and it just stops being functional. Um, so that, that's why I say like, <laughs> It's, it's good to like start with those foundations. Start with where you can. Um, for example, I, I do do some things. <laughs> I'm not so terrible. I do tend to have files that say final, final, final. But um, <laughs> I also have like, every, like as Chrissy does, every time I get a new client or a new project, I start a new folder and everything goes into that folder. And within that folder, I'll usually have like a folder for sketches, a folder for concepts, a folder for um, color uh, files so that it's easier for me to track things. So I'm not like great at it, but, but at least the foundations are there so that eventually it'll be easier to scale. Yeah. <laughs> It's organized chaos. That's all we do here. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we mean is like, you know, like Liz said, you know, you start slowly and, you know, maybe all of a sudden you end up with a bunch of new projects and you've gone from only having to keep track of one or two to having to keep track of like five of them. And mm -hmm. it can get very confusing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say if you do nothing else, um, put the date in the file name somewhere because if nothing else you can oh, always no, check that really confusing for me <laughs> yeah i don't okay maybe not but, but for know. some people that works like i know i have yeah, for some clear. people that works coming up on this episode of guildcast 20 to 30 percent of all of your revenue put into a separate checking account that is just for taxes mm -hmm just for taxes. That way, end of year, quarter, however often you're paying your taxes, the money's there. Join the Graphic Artists Guild to listen to the full version of this episode at www.graphicartistsguild.org. Thanks for listening to Guildcast. Coming up in next week's episode... Or do you feel like your ice cream selection carries over into your creative decision-making process at all? Yeah, I find myself going for the same fonts over and over and over again. I'm like, Chrissy, just try another one. Like, it's not going to hurt. You can always change it. You don't have to use Railway every single time. <laughs> all, my ice cream and, all my ice cream choices influence my creative life. <laughs> Really surprised. No, because like all of this is like the creative de decision making process. Exactly. Um, yeah. And all of those can bring anxiety. Guildcast is a weekly podcast series based on the three pillars of the Graphic Artists Guild advocacy, community, and business resources. 
Keep listening to learn more about the Graphic Artists Guild and visit our website at www.graphicartistsguild.org.